everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to the series where I go through different RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one, I'm going to be going through the One Ring Moria Through the Doors of Durin. This is the new upcoming Moria supplement uh, from Free League for the One Ring role-playing game. This is the best version of Moria that I've ever seen. It's, in fact, it's one of the best products I've ever seen, period. It is so cool. It is so incredible. I backed this a while back. I've had this PDF for a while. Obviously, this is the alpha, um, so this isn't finished by any means. But the new, the complete version, I think, is being printed up right now. They're going to start fulfillment in July, but you can still late pledge for this thing. So I'll put a link below to where you can get it uh, in late pledge. And you can obviously get it for the One Ring, or you can get it for the 5e version. Um, I prefer the One Ring role-playing uh, system. And I'm, I just, I love this PDF. This this product, this book is so incredible. It's 227 pages. It's a massive document. It's going to be a massive book. And it goes through the entirety of Moria. Great ideas. If you're interested in running Moria itself, either for the One Ring or for 5e, if you buy the 5e version, or you just want to take inspiration from this book because the art, the ideas, the, the, the mechanics, the tables, it's all incredible. So I'm going to go through this book and just give you guys uh, you know, my thoughts on it and uh, highlight some of the things that I think are awesome. First of all, look at this map. This is the map of Moria. And if you don't know anything about the One Ring, the maps in the One Ring are incredible. Beautiful, beautiful maps. Look at this. Both the uh, side view and the top-down view. You get the Dimerald Dale on the right. Uh, you get the Valley of Welcome on the left. The West Moria, the Road, the Duero Delve Old Moria. The straight road, the upper mines, the stairs, <laughs> you get the upper levels. It, it, there's just so much going on here. And obviously because this is set after The Hobbit, but before The Lord of the Rings, the One Ring is set in that period, you get dwarves in here, right? Durin's company, Durin's expedition, obviously. Um, well, it's not Durin, Balin's company was coming back in here um, after, uh, after The Hobbit, but before The Lord of the Rings. And you still have that going on, but you have the rising of the orcs. You have the deepest levels, the deeps. Oh my goodness, this this product is so cool. This book is so cool. Look at the, I mean, look at the, this motifs along this side. The Moria words, how they have the different chambers and levels there. This book is gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. And that's one of the things that you, I mean, I find about all of the One Ring books is that they're just staggeringly beautiful. And it's Free League, right? What do you expect from Free League at this point? But the best kind of presentation. Um, and the breast motifs and all of that stuff. You have the lead writer and the, there are various people who've gone through it. Um, I think this is really, really cool. Now, it's interesting. It says solo play is uh, one of the solo players was Matt Click. Um, I wonder if that's Matt Click from A Fistful of Dice. I don't know. Um, he used to be a great uh, YouTube channel, or he, he still has his, his material still on there. I used to follow it all the time back in the day. I wonder if that's him. I don't know, actually. Here is the rundown of what you get here. Now, obviously, this is an incomplete, this is an alpha uh, PDF, so some of the art pieces aren't here, some of the text is still TBD. But overall, man, this is incredible. You get broken down into sections. Um, each section has its own piece of art, except for the appendix and solo play sections. Uh, that's one of the things that the One Ring has been leaning into, I think, recently, is solo play. More documents have come out for solo play, so you can, if you're, if you're the kind of person who's into solo play, then this is, uh, you know, a great, a great book for you too, because it has a bunch of rules for it and how to how to play through the adventures that you might find. Um, but everything is, of course, hyperlinked, so <laughs> just the way I always like it. Oh, love that piece of art. Look at that. But I would not lead you into Moria if there were no hope of coming out again. I love it. Love it. I love it. I've said this before when I reviewed the One Ring, but. Clearly, the people who put this book together have a deep and abiding love for Tolkien's world. For Tolkien's writing, it's just so clear. Um, this is definitely someone who wants to build on it and embrace it and respect it. And I love that. A Light in the Darkness. The overview of Moria and what it is. Uh, the history of Moria. I love these pieces of incidental art. And it's not incidental art, just page art. I love this style. They're the two styles of the One Ring that they tend to have. I like this one better. The other one has its place, and I really liked, for example, that Door of Moria. That was a great uh, piece of the other style. But I tend to prefer this one because it feels much more like, I don't know, you know, Alan Lee or John Howe uh, in those illustrated copies that I used to read when I was a kid of Tolkien. So it's how I picture Tolkien's world. It's closer to that. Really, really great rundown. But this is great. I mean, look at this. This is incredible. <laughs> that, such a great piece of art. And at the gates, the trumpets rang. That's, of course, from... 
uh, Gimli's song as he enters into Moria. Love that piece there. Moria in your game, how to play it, what the focus of a campaign should be in Moria, and how it relates to the wider world with the dwarves and, uh, you know, <laughs> the various NPCs that are interested in this place, the different dwarves that are trying to reclaim it or enter into it or, or delve it. And I think that's really cool to get a sense of all of them as well. And men, middlemen and the hobbits, the thieves of Tharbad. Of course, of course, Tharbad is sort of a focus of the first um, set of books. Tharbad is one of the places where you really would probably play a campaign. And so this is sort of the eastern edge of that domain that you might travel from. So if you're based in Tharbad, you're going to have connections to here. The name of Moria is black. The rumors, false rumors and genuine rumors. Famous landmarks and obscure landmarks. How to run Moria, the themes of wonder, <laughs> vast and intricate beyond imagination, the dark and secret way, the ancient work of giants. The land where our fathers worked of old, piles of gold and jewels, a city reclaimed. Themes of sorrow and fear, really cool. Journeys in the dark, that's another great piece of art there. Love that one. Into the Long Dark, and so these are going to be random tables that you can start using to develop um, to develop your adventures as you travel through it, the journey section, the journey sequence of the Middle Earth, uh, of uh, the One Ring. So ways of making the actual journey itself interesting, how to, you know, give kind of the checks that you have to succeed or else you get these fatigue points, and, you know, it's basically the way the journeying works, the, the, uh, the uh, travel phase, the, the, the uh, journey phase on the overworld. It works the same thing in Moria. How to describe it. Lots of great ideas here for things to consider as you run this game. Groaning of the mountains, footsteps, scraping dark dreams. That's really cool. Drums in the deep. The eye awareness and how that works in Moria and how you can build it or, or, or drop it as they go through. You're trying to stay unnoticed, of course, as the Fellowship is as they go through Moria. Dire Portents and a D12 table essentially to... You know, see of uh, what are the uh, the revelations that occur before you actually have an encounter. The orc assault and how that works. Um, terrors of the dark. Doom approaches stalked by a nameless thing. All the way up to a moment of truth. And what I like about this, of course, is that the Eye of Sauron is a very bad thing. And the uh, Gandalf sign is a very good thing. All of these tables have this. But the, even the, the very good thing is usually like a very brief reprieve. Um... I think that's really interesting. So even, for example, the, the gosh, which is the you know, fire, I think that's what that word means in Orcish. Um, gosh table. If you roll on the uh, Doom Approaches and you have to do a revelation from this gosh table, but even the best of it is a player hero glimpses Durin's bane in the darkness or in their dreams. They know that the Balrog is nearby and that a quick retreat is advisable. Like Dane, they have seen the shadow that waits in the deep. That's the best you've got <laughs> if you roll on that. Table for Moria Madness, and then the random table, table or sorry, random chamber generators. So you have a bunch of these chamber types, condition tables, appearance table, cha uh, challenge tables. What can happen there? And then you have a random orc band generator. So the feet die table, a success die table, and then you get the actual orcs and the fell foes in this part. There are older and fouler things than orcs in the deep places of the world. So good. Orcs and the orcs of Moria, orcs of Udun, which is a particular fire-touched orc, right? Uh, the son of Balg. He's the kind of the big bad there. Orcs of Mordor. And then you get dwarves. You get slave dwarves. Dwarven thralls. So new uh, minions that you can face there. Dwarven haunts. The Balrog of Moria. That's such a good piece of art for the Balrog. I, I, I like the way that this artist has taken the Balrog. You know, there's there's lots of different ways of taking it. And a lot of them kind of mimic the, the Baylor D&D which, of course, itself is based on old artwork for, you know, uh, the Balrog from early editions of the, of, the, um, of the books, the Alan Lee, John Howe pictures for the Balrog, which then also were, you know, sort of taken as the base for the movie. And I think a lot of people do, this is much more spectral, right? It's much more shadow than shadow and flame, or it's both shadow and flame. And that's sort of how it's described in the book. It's not given a very, very clear image. And I like the way that it's done here. It's very evocative, and it fits with the, the, the concept of the Balrog, which is a demon, right? A very powerful demon. Other foul things here. Ash rates. Uh, cave bats. Marrow eaters. Stone toads. Tappers. And then the mansions of the, of the dwarves. The delving of the dwarves. The Dimral Dale, and basically what you have right here is the breakdown of all of the um, the different locations within Moria, 
and you have different entrances uh, by landmark. The Dimrill Stair, so this is on the eastern side moving there, so look, you said work in progress, not final. You get a lot of pieces of art are like that in this book, but for the most part it's pretty much complete as is. The Mounds of Azan... Azanul Bizar. Azanul Bizar. <laughs> I don't know how to say that. I think that's right though, Azanul Bizar. It's obscure, so it makes sense. Um, I should note, by the way, that I backed this. That's how I have this pre-copy. <laughs> I wasn't sent to do anything like that. I backed it on their uh, on their pre pre. Uh, I think I got it at the late pledge stage. The East Gate of Moria. It's interesting because you go kind of east west through this book, which is really interesting. It sort of assumes there's going to be the dwarves from the eastern side going west, but it doesn't have to be the case. Um, and again, you get great pieces of art throughout this book. Old Moria, the first hall. I love these isometric pieces for the locations that you run into here. Uh, the second hall and Durange Bridge. So good. So good. Oh, man. The Reek Bat, the last readout of the dwarves. It's a hidden room. And there are, you can see that it says obscure, hidden, or famous, these landmarks, these places. Um, like the second hall and Durance Bridge is famous, but the last readout of the dwarves is hidden. That refers to the checks that you might need to find it and the various ways that it uh, would relate to rumors and things like that. So, really, really cool. And then there's also rumors that you can read for them and old lore that go along with them for these sections. Schemes and Troubles, The Bones of Nain. And then there's always these side points which have further information about that region and how they work. This one has the Ring of Keys, which is really cool. I'll read through it because I like this one. This huge Ring of Keys is a magic item in its own right. Dozens of ornate keys hang from a perfect circle of mithril. These keys unlock all the doors of the Duero Delph. The enchantment of opening and returning bestowed on the ring means that the right key is always to hand. It ensures the ring cannot be lost or stolen. If taken, it appears again in the possession of its rightful owner at some point later. That's pretty magical for Lord of the Rings, but it, I think it's fine. The ring can only be removed if the bearer is slain or voluntarily hands control over to another. Additionally, looking through the circle of metal reveals hidden doors and compartments it below bears a blessing of scam, which is kind of an effect. The player hero who takes the ring from Nain's grave becomes the new key bearer. Among the doors opened by the Ring of Keys, as you have the East Gate, famous landmark. This is a large and heavy iron key very old and solid. The Dimrill Door, hidden landmark, a much smaller key of Mithril with the number 17 written upon it. The Secret Cleft, another Mithril key, this one marked with the Crown of Durin. The Vault of the Uruk Tharbun, an immensely ornate key with a handle of gold. The Royal Armory, a key of steel marked with a sign of crossed axes. The Door of the City, similar to the East Gate key, but clearly newer in design. The Citadel of the Ringsmiths. Not a key at all, but the key of rings itself counts as a magic ring. Really fascinating. So this is just, I love that stuff. If you're going to take Lord of the Rings and kind of make it into a game, and you're going to have an RPG that has you know, builds on the tradition of both Lord of the Rings, but also incorporates some of the elements of RPGs that we're familiar with, like magic items, this is the way to do it. A, a, a relic, a, a, a ring of power in its own right. You know, because of course the dwarves have many near magic artifacts that they have created. This is sort of like that. It's a little a little bit on the more magic-y side than I would tend to like, as I said. But I think for the most part, it's a great it's a great item. The Duero Delph itself. This is the great realm and city of the Duero Delph. And of old it was not so it was not darksome, but full of light and splendor. Oh, so good. You have the Bloodvine creature here, Therm's Eye. Look at that. It's like it's like a <laughs> what do you even call it? Um, this is the uh, the caves of Thrym Thistlebeard. So this is like sort of a guy's estate, right? Uh, built into this um, particularly large cavern. I love that. It's so cool. And of course it makes sense, right, that in the Dwarven city you would have like Dwarven estates in different parts of it. Ah, oh, the King's Hall. King he was on carven throne in many pillared halls of stone, with golden roof and silver floor and runes of power upon the door. So good. This is where they have sort of like a, I don't know, like an arena set up, like the, 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 well, the orcs have. <laughs> and you have to you know, fight your way through it, or if you get caught and thrown in there, you have to survive. The Chamber of Mazar Bul. It's an obscure chamber. The Vault of Uruk Tharbun. Oof, that looks very confusing. Very confusing. But there'd be a way of navigating through it and finding the empty vaults as you go through. And there's a giant centipede in here. Nasty. Oh, so cool, though. The Fortress of Malak. Hmm. Imri the Traitor. He was a dwarven blacksmith from the Blue Mountains. Malak One-Eye. So you have a bunch of NPCs and a bunch of monsters here. The Redhorn Gate and the Citadel. Um, and uh, this is up on top 
of the of the mountains. Really cool. Oh, I love this one. It's so creepy. Red nails. The skin of red nails is corpse pale, and she dresses all in white. Only her long nails are red as blood. Snava the Mordor Orc has heard the legends of red nails. Sauron commanded Snava and his comrades to awaken all the old evil powers of the North in preparation for the coming war. Many of these efforts are described in Tales from the Lone Lands. The creature Red Nails, likely a vampire spirit, dwells right on his doorstep. Red Nails has not been seen by travelers in many years, and Snava suspects she has fallen into slumber. How better to wake a vampire than by luring some fresh meat to her door? So vampires, if, if you guys, they do have a part in Lord of the Rings, or rather the Silmarillion. There are vampires in their spirit, uh, in and spirits, in the old, um, in the old stories of the Silmarillion. So it makes sense that if you're looking at the very old things in the deep places of the world, there would be these vampire spirits. Now I don't think. Um, the One Ring has the rights to the Silmarillion. I think they have the rights to the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit. But, I, mean, I might be wrong about that, but I don't think they do. But the idea of a vampire spirit, it's not copyrighted by the Tolkien estate, right? <laughs> and it makes sense within the context of that stuff they don't have access to. So because it's not copyrighted, they can reference it. So it's not outside the Lord of the Rings world, this idea of the vampiric spirit. Some people were worried about that. I know, like, how... You know, how faithful to Tolkien's canon can you get and still be sort of a fun RPG where you encounter new things, new monsters? And I think this book does a great job of doing stuff like this. This is a terrifying creature, but it, it fits within the canon. Um, it's not the stuff you're going to run into, but it works with the world. Uh, not the stuff you're going to run into casually, right? You're not going to run into lots of vampires or something like that. But this particular thing from the ancient world, it fits. And I think it's really cool. Really creepy. And, uh, and that piece of art is excellent. The Mountain Galleries. Har would be Lord of Moria. <laughs> He's an evil dwarf who has made alliances with goblins, as again we see in Lord of the Rings and in The Hobbit, or we hear about, rather. Tarlock's Hall. Tarlock, chieftain of the cloudy head folk. I love this one, too. You know, again, like, uh, there's only so much I can say about this book because I just wanted to show it off. It's so gorgeous. Um... And it's one of those things where even if you don't play the One Ring, or you don't intend to, it's such good inspiration. Now, it's a lot of text, but that's kind of what you're getting it for, right? This is not, you're not getting a quick sort of old school, or I should say, you know, OSR style adventure, um, where you're just getting something really quick to run and easy to run through. This is a campaign setting where you're going to play long adventures through Moria and going through the different places different opportunities, the Udun Temple, right? Those, the deeper you get, the more outright evil the things become, and the more related to the Balrog you get. Um, yeah, the Balrog's throne, for example. So I think as inspiration, and again, this, a lot of the illustrations still to come and stuff like that. It's really interesting. Right now, the Watcher in the Water is still deep beneath Moria. It's not yet out uh, in the lake uh, by the entrance. So you can still run into it, but it's down, down, deep into the earth. So that's Moria itself. Then you get the appendices, which is if you want to play Balin's expedition, you can. There are rules for how to do that, what the timing should be, if you run across them, or if you, uh, how do you, you know, as you're playing and the players go there and they want to interact with Balin, where would he be in this year? What would have happened at this point? So it's kind of a cool timeline of what's going on. Some GMs are going to be a bit hesitant to do that because, especially if you're trying to stay faithful, well, what if the players really change things? Remember, what if they kill Balin? <laughs> well, um, probably they're not going to do that. But, you know, you'd have to know your group and you have to know what you're doing if you want to keep the can. And you could also obviously change it. It's up to you. You can totally change things. <laughs> it's your game. And then there's the search for Thrain and Aragorn's journey. So what if, you know, if Gandalf, both Gandalf and Aragorn came through Moria, what if you run into them and what might they have been doing here and how might their adventures have gone if you want to run into them while you're here? And I think that's really cool. Um, and then you get on Mithril and how that works and, and special magic rewards you could receive from Mithril. And there's a burden of Mithril. Uh, you know, when you have it, there's a uh, <laughs> you have uh, you know. Well, I guess in this case, it's saying it's this, it's the opposite. It's 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 lighter. But I would imagine that there's sort of a moral or like a a weight. The way that Bilbo or that Frodo feels the weight, not physically, but like the importance of the Mithril shirt he has when he hears about it. When he hears about when when Gimli talks about it, for example, 
he sort of feels that he, he doesn't deserve it or something like that. I imagine there's something like that. Moria, and then a special extra um, culture that you can play. The uh, the dwarves of Nogron and Belagost. And then there's a section on solo play. If you want to reclaim Casa Doom, your solo adventure, your band, shared callings. How to basically play the game with this idea of solo play. Um, in particular, relating to Moria. You know, the missions you might want to do, how to do them, how to test if you've succeeded or failed, just all that stuff for solo play. You know, it's not something that I do myself, so I'm not as interested in this part of the book. But if you're one of those people who really do like it, then it'd be great to do. And also you can see there's lots of tables that are really good in relation to this idea of solo play. And you could use these for your campaign creation, you could use these for solo play, obviously, but you use them for other things as well. So you wouldn't have to just use them for solo play. How battles in solo play work, how duels work, councils and journeys, how that works in solo play. The fellowship phase, and then the end of all things. That's the very end of the book. So this is, I mean, just such a gorgeous, such a gorgeous book. And again, if you're someone who plays the One Ring, I highly recommend getting this. If you're not someone who plays the One Ring, if you're someone who um, just really likes Lord of the Rings, I'd also recommend getting it. But if you're someone who really is thinking about doing like a, a big dwarven city or an underdark adventure or you need inspiration for those sorts of things and you want that Tolkien feel to your world, then this would be a, this would be a great source book. I highly recommend it to anybody in those circumstances. I just recommend it, period. Such a, a beautiful product. All right, guys. Well, that's it for me for this video. I hope this has been interesting, and I'll see you in another one.